this is Cam Lee of Massacre, and you're listening to Nothing Shocking Podcast with Eric and Jeff. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Huntied, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Libsyn or any podcatchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music. For our intro and bumper ending, tonight's guest is... Cam Lee from Massacre. Yeah, he's promoting Massacre's newest EP, Mythos. Yeah. And what an entertaining interview Cam was. Yeah, let's go to that interview right now. All right. Good night. Cam, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce you my co-host, Jeff Unteed. Yeah, Cam, thanks for joining us tonight. All right, no problem. Hey, uh, well, hey, Massacre recently released the band's newest EP, Mythos. Can you talk a little bit more about the writing and recording process for this new endeavor for the band? Yeah, that, actually, you know, it's it's a weird thing. I, I had done another interview, and I completely forgot to mention this. But uh, Mythos is actually the material that's on it was recorded generally the same time and written the same time resurgence was recorded oh wow okay. Okay. So, so it's it's like all the all the same members that were was on resurgence uh the same lineup and and the, the same writing uh staff so uh originally and what happened was of course everyone can identify with this covid yeah. and <laughs> covid happened and it totally just messed up a lot of stuff um, it, it threw plan, it, it, it monkey wrenches left and right and plans. And um, originally, Mythos was going to be split into two different singles. So uh, if you actually have the physical version of it, if the physical version, if you open up the CD, um, the other cover, which went to the serpent behind the serpent's curse and done with horror, uh, it had a, it has a different separate artwork because originally they were supposed to be singles. Yeah. And the original idea was they were going to bookend Resurgence. So literally one single was going to come out, which is the first two tracks, which is Behind the Serpent's Curse and Dunwich Horror. And then Resurgence was supposed to come out. And then Mythos, the actual, was going to come out, which is uh, the Mythos that Lovecraft built and the thing on the doorstep. That was going to be a single that came out after Resurgence album. But because of COVID and the way things just got everything messed up, um, the label decided, look, why don't we just push the album and get that out instead of pushing a single out? And I said, yeah, I think that's a better idea. Oh, well, very good. How many songs do you guys normally write for an album? Do, do you record more than is needed for the album, or do you just record, like, you, you map Actually, it out first? Uh, how I did, we I approached this. Uh, Massacre's a weird band. It's been split up and together and broken up and i actually came back into it at the end of uh 2016 around pretty much 2017 mm. and was trying to get it organized and 
went through a whole bunch of different stuff um, through 2017, 18, and 19. 2019 is when I pretty much secured uh, the trademark for the band and pretty much the band, I guess you could say, kind of I got into the captain's seat. So from that point on, I knew what I wanted to do musically. And I've been working on a bunch of other projects for years, uh, especially with Rogo Johansson, who played guitar, and Johnny, who also played guitar, and a bunch of different other projects and bands that we've done together. And same process is um, when we decided, okay, we're, I said we're going to do a Massacre album. Yeah, that's kind of how we do it. We kind of throw uh, about uh, 15, 16 songs together. And then we pick the best of those. And my the way that I write is is like I was listening to some of your other podcasts, like some of the other guys talking about how in this COVID time, it kind of like got to a point where everyone was at home using their computers and writing right. and sending files back and forth. Mm -hmm. I've actually been doing that since 2007. Yeah. I, I've actually yeah. so I kind of like was prepared for COVID when it hit. <laughs> Because it's like that's literally what I've been doing since 2007 with all of my projects, all my recording. But I've been working with guys in Sweden since 2007. So I have a you know guitar players in Sweden, a drummer in Norway. I've been working with guys, you know, all this time, basically file sharing and everything. So it was easy for me. So how we went about it was I just said, okay, we're going to do a massacre album, and I think there were 16 songs total written. And I had the guy split it up because I knew I was going to use Roga and I know I was going to use Johnny. And I didn't want everybody just all once like doing it. And Roga and I work really well. Like I said, we've been working since 2007. Mm. So Roga has a technique where he'll send me riffs, usually to a click track, almost in a structure because we worked so long together. He kind of knows how I like to structure things. So it was really simple for him to kind of just put the songs together and start sending them to me. Johnny, however, uh, I worked with him with just one project, and he had to kind of pull back because he's more melodic. He's has very he's very Swedish style of death metal, so he had to kind of pull back. And I said, "Look, Johnny, listen to stuff from pretty much 1990 through 1993, and kind of like go into that envelope right there and listen to those influences there." Once I kind of told him what to do, he started coming back with stuff that was just brilliant. And there wasn't really a lot of changes. I mean, how they send me riffs. I say, okay, let's structure this this way. Let's do this measurement sort of like this. Let's uh, cut this a little in half or let's add a little bit to this. And it's just generally that, that easy. And like I said, I've been doing this since 2007, so it, it went really, really quick. Oh, so cool. Well, you know, Behind the Serpent's Curse is the track that sticks out most to me. <laughs> Can you talk a bit more about the inspiration, the creativity for that track? Yeah, um, that's actually uh, one of the tracks, the first tracks that, like I said, was, was going to bookend and come out first. So lyrically, I had the idea of writing that um, from two different perspectives. I used Lovecraft and a lot of Lovecraft aesthetics sort of in my lyrics, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm basically 100% basing something off of a Lovecraft story. I just loosely use Lovecraft metaphorically. Um, so... I knew the story, The Curse of Yig, mm. which is a Lovecraft story, just basically about a serpent. But I, I took it more metaphorically, and I thought about certain things like, okay, serpents in general, society are viewed as like, you know, okay, Satan was a serpent in the Garden of Eden. Uh, we think of serpents as being slimy and, and you know, slithering. <laughs> you say stuff when someone's lying. Like I think the Native American Indian said that if you you, you spoke total lie you're with a forked tongue, like a serpent. So a lot of that I thought about serpents as representing somebody that was a liar, or somebody that was backstabbing, or somebody that was two-faced. So there's a line in that which, if you saw the artwork, there's a the artwork has a two two-headed snake. Yeah. And there's a line about being a two-headed alabaster serpent um, in the lyrics. And the lyrics generally follow the Curse of Yig story. However, it also has sort of a metaphorical, uh, for me, about having to deal with per certain people that are liars, certain people that are two-faced, how they're oh, okay. one face is they're mm -hmm. friendly all, you know, nice and cool, and behind your back, they stab you behind your back, and mm -hmm. then they're, they, yep, 
So that's literally what that is about. It's, it's beware the serpent's curse is literally about the people. Beware of people who can be two-faced. Oh. Beware of two-faced liars. Oh, very good. Jeff, do you want me to take the next one? You well, got no, the next yeah, one? I was going to ask you about the next song, uh, The Dunwich Horror. That's one of the ones I liked. What, 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 can you tell me a little bit about that song? Yeah, that one is just straightforward, old-school death metal. That's one of the first ones that Roga wrote. And I said, uh, wow, it's it's short, it's to the point, it's sweet. It reminds me of stuff like the 80s death yeah. metal, like when I first started, uh, going all the way back to the 80s. So it had that kind of feeling. And I didn't, again, want to... Ch- 100 percent take everything from the story of the dunwich horror however in that story that basically deals with um the the waitley family and lavidia waitley is the female she's the woman in the story and there really isn't much focus when you read the lovecraft story about her but other than you know okay she gives birth to these two twins yeah. and again there's that two-faced kind of thing the twins two evil twins um so that's song is generally directly based off of the story but still has that sort of twin thing going on because i mentioned that in this in this in the last verse about uh she gives birth to two twins kind of these evil twins so again there's that whole two-faced kind of thing about um watching you know there's always a liar there's always two two evil things and in my experience in life Unfortunately, anytime I've ever crossed to come across liars, there's always two of them. <laughs> there's always like there's always like the one guy that's like manipulating everything, and then there's the little yes guy in the background. <laughs> yeah, boss. Yeah, boss. I agree with you, boss. Everything. Yeah, boss. You're right, boss. So I've dealt with a lot of people like that in my life. But the funny thing is, I've always realized that behind those two guys and there usually are in my life, there's also a matriarch behind it. There's always a woman, and I'm not trying to be misogynistic here, <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah. there seems to always be a woman behind the whole thing. Oh, there is. And that literally is the story. That's kind of like, ah, oh, okay, that reminds me of the Dunwich Horror, <laughs> yeah. you know? <laughs> oh, very good. Well, you, know, you kind of touched on this with COVID. I mean, like I said, you, you were working on these this new material, these new albums. Um, but you said, you know, like you said, you referred to, you're used to file sharing since 2007. Um, right. Since you're, you were so used to working in with these trials and tribulations, sending files over to Europe, back and forth, back and forth, um, I guess maybe what obstacles did you have to deal with when dealing with the COVID pandemic and not being able to, I guess maybe, I guess the human factor of, of things, uh, or did did this just pretty much happen pretty easy for you, regardless of COVID or not? Well, I think every for everybody, including myself. I mean, I'm a, in real life. I'm a hermit, so it didn't matter too much about me going out. But it it, it did it it threw a big monkey wrench in the plans. Like I had a plan before COVID hit. I remember when we were touring, and I was in South America, and we were coming back, and this is right at the beginning of COVID, I think this was like in November. And I remember being pulled to the side uh, while I was getting ready to get on the plane. And they were asking for all the Americans. And I'm like, oh, man, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm in South America. I'm, I'm in, and they're asking all the Americans to come to this, over here to this line. So I'm like, really, like, what's going on? And they started taking our temperature. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that was weird. I was like, okay, what is going on? And And that was the real kind of like a uh, sense of like oh man this is like we're going into the apocalypse yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've watched every 80s movie about this this is how it starts <laughs> I'm like it, it starts like this I literally was thinking that but what happened was after we got back like I said the biggest monkey wrench was every plan I had a, I, I'm, a I'm a planner so I like my five year plan just got a big, pretty much two years. Yeah, pushed pushed two years back. Mm. So that's literally what happened. I mean, it's it's from pretty much 20, 2020, which was the year that nobody. It, it was the dead year. Yeah. I don't know what anybody <laughs> did. Twenty twenty, and then twenty twenty one, we started to sort of recover, but you know, it really wasn't. It was like okay, a slow recovery, and now we're almost at the end of twenty twenty two, and we're just now, I think to somewhat normal, you know, getting back to somewhat of a normal normalcy, but I don't think it's ever going to be normal. Yeah. I mean, I, it's the crazy thing. 
No, I, I, I really believe it. we're going to be seeing people walk around with masks on for years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we're seeing more and more artists releasing EP format style albums opposed to the traditional LP. Um, is Massacre, you know, are, are, are you now leaning towards the, you know, the extended play stuff, the EP stuff where you don't have to worry about putting a full length album out? But, you know, the band's history has been, hey, you guys have always been LP oriented band. Or singles at a time. You know, what are we looking for as uh, you know, uh, you know, albums in the future for you guys? What what type of format are we going to look at here? Well, actually, you know, it's actually cool that you ask about that because since I pretty much got, like I said, in the captain's seat in 2019, and really got things going, like I said, there was that two year, you know, bump because of COVID. Once 2021 hit is when we really started coming out with stuff. And I got Mike Borders, the original bass player, back in. And this is the guy that was all the way back in the 80s. And we nice. he got back involved. And we got, we really went to a lot of discussions of talking about how things were in the 80s. You know, being real old and nostalgic. And you're sitting, you're sitting there having coffee and going, you remember the old days? <laughs> yeah, I remember yeah. the old days. <laughs> yeah, remember when we used to do this? Yeah, let's do that again. So it was like that. We're having a conversation. And it was like, Mike. Why don't we just, uh, I mean, I understand we're, you know, we got to work with labels, but why don't we just do stuff ourselves like we used to back in the old days? So we've been releasing singles ourselves mm. um, that aren't the songs on the album. Yeah. Um, and we started this before the album came out. We released a single uh, called uh, Dead Beyond Death, which we redid. It was the 30th anniversary of From Beyond, which was the first album. So we decided to redo the first, that track and release that. And then that felt so cool. That was really cool. We just did it ourselves. We just put it out, sold uh, a very limited amount, physical copies ourselves that we pressed up ourselves. You can get the rest of them always digital on our Bandcamp. That was cool. So like 2021 Halloween, because Halloween's a big day for me. It's my birthday, plus I love Halloween. Oh, cool. We, de- we decided to write a Halloween song. And release it on Halloween. So we did that. That came out as a single. That went really well. And then that was going so well, we're like, let's keep doing this. So then again, later, we did the Ancient Evil single, which was us doing a bunch of cover songs from bands that we really like, really underground bands. Like, we did a a Necrophasia cover on it, covered my original band, Mantis, and we covered a, a Repulsion song and put that out. And we actually have something coming out on September 1st. Again, another single that we're doing so we've been releasing singles ourselves through Bandcamp, pretty much like for digital and then a limited amount of physical if people want physical and i've been going with another label that's uh does seven inches seven metal inches records out of germany Mm, mm, real good friends with nuclear blast so (laughs) it's kind of like an okay thing and uh we release a limited amount of the singles on vinyl that way pretty cool color vinyl little collection items and stuff like that color vinyl either clear or red vinyl or something and we put out about maybe 200 cds and once we sell out we sell out we don't repress them oh cool cool. very cool well uh you alluded to uh, having a new single coming out september 1st uh it's called casket mutilations if i'm correct i'm not sure if i'm correct but uh Mm -hmm. what 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 can you tell us about the uh, what to expect for the new song well, on that one, we, are, like I said, we're old. <laughs> so uh, yeah. the original demo came out in 1986. It was actually written in 85, and it came out in January of 1986. And there was a song on there called Mutilated. And that's literally the very first song that Massacre wrote when I got into the band, because the band was a cover band before I joined. And I joined and wrote this this was the first song you could say that one of the first death metal songs written in 1985 and the demo came out in 86 and i've always wanted to redo this song and i really thought you know this is a chance this is an opportunity to you know all these years later to redo it well let's have fun and just do it and it came out really well and it came out you know it it went really well really good and then i had johnny who um also played on the album he wanted to write something i said well you know you did so well of writing stuff in that 80s style why don't you write something in the 80s style and he did something like in two days he sent me a completely (laughs) new track and i was like okay i'm gonna keep it simple and write it like i would if i was in 1986 like keep the lyrics simple and that's called nailed into the casket 
Oh, and cool. a big thing for me was when I had joined Massacre back in 85, I'm a big horror movie fan. So um, that song, when I originally wrote it in 85, was based on a horror movie that had just come out the year before and was circulating around the drive-in, because I was a big drive-in movie guy. I loved going to the drive-in mm-hmm. movies. And in 85, one of the biggest drive-in movies at the time was the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Oh, and that yeah. was circling through the drive And I remember seeing that, and that's what Mutilated was about. So I was like, you know, it's all these years later. You know, unfortunately, Wes Craven passed away. But let's, you know, do Mutilated. Let's dedicate to the memory of Wes Craven and just, like, do, do a completely total, you know, tribute to the night, original Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh. So that's literally... Yeah, that's literally what the albums are the singles about. Oh, cool. Oh, very cool. Well, I want to bring this back to uh, Resurgence. Um, you know, the, were the tracks recorded actually before COVID, or were, were you guys still working on Resurgence during COVID? How did it work? Uh, we were, I, yeah, we were working. We, the first year COVID hit is literally when we started writing it. So it was 2019 and going into 2020. Okay. Um, we, we started. We started writing it. We. I had. I had ideas. I'm. I'm like again. I'm a planner and I'm a big idea guy. I've got notebooks full of lyrics, and I literally have notebooks full of stuff that I've written. And I'll find something. I don't ever. It's weird because I'll have pages and pages of lyrics. And majority of the time, what I have to do is kind of trim my lyrics down, mm-hmm. and find the find the best lines that work well and i'm an old school guy so i'm not like these newer death metal guys i'm i come from a old school punk background so i always like to have that little hook in that chorus Mm -hmm. and kind of a reframe and a lot of stuff like that where it repeats itself i mean that's probably kind of i grew up in the you know 80s on stuff like that so uh i always kind of have add that to my my lyrics and and try to have a catchy chorus or have something that repeats itself a lot so I end up trimming a lot of lyrics down, but I have notebooks full of lyrics. And uh, so it's real easy for me to kind of like, go, OK, I'm going to go through this notebook because I know this is the section of the notebook that I have an idea. And I, I have conceptualized this idea of what resurgence was going to be basically Lovecraft influenced and just kind of like went through that and picked the best songs, picked the best lyrics that represented I thought was going to represent the album the best. Well, help me out. It was released in 2021, still in pandemic mode here. Uh, mm-hmm. Did you have any reservations about uh, releasing the album during still pretty much the height of the pandemic, or it was business as usual? Yeah, I mean, we actually, yeah, we we did. I, I was wondering if we should hold off, but Mike was saying you know to me he's like oh man we've, we've been at the, we've been at this since because mike was there at the beginning we've been at this since 2018 generally so it's like 2018 2019 2020 almost felt like because we were we had a different lineup at the time and we went through three years of mike and i where there was nothing being done <laughs> nothing was being written and uh um those members left we got new members and and uh we said okay now we're going to start writing stuff. And it, we had that excitement, that fire of write, new stuff being written. And we were really excited about it. And I, I asked Mike, I said, should we wait? Should we sit? And he's like, I'm tired of waiting. <laughs> he's yeah. like, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm in my 50s, man. I don't want to wait anymore. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we'll put it out then. <laughs> Oh, very good, very good. Jeff, you got the next question. Well, I was just thinking, you know, as we're talking to you, you're, you're, you're you know, I read somewhere your vocal style is like death grunt or death growl. Um, yeah. When you when you're meeting fans and you're talking, you know, like you are to us, you know, right now, mm-hmm. have you ever had a fan that's just like completely shocked by like like you're you're normal, <laughs> you sound normal, <laughs> you know, but you don't yeah. sound normal on the record. So I, 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 yeah, because a lot of people, there's a rumor around that I'm I'm a I'm a real a hole. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think what happens is when people meet me, they're like, hey, you're not as bad as I heard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, 
I was having a flashback while, while we were talking because when I was when I was in college, I got to go to Germany, and I I remember we were, we were flying from. Uh, uh, Frankfurt to Munich or vice versa, I can't remember, but but the WWF was flying with us in coach, and and I Macho Man Randy Savage was standing in front of me with I think I don't know who he was, I can't remember who he was standing with, but they, they were just carrying on a normal conversation, just talking like we are now, and my friend was like my friend like tapped him on the shoulder and he turned around, he's like how you doing, you know, and it's like it was just, I was just having that kind of flashback. It's funny. Well, you know that's the you know, the thing that it's so funny because. Uh, fans or people maybe that are not fans of whatever genre it is they think of death metal musicians yeah. as being deathly scary yeah. and when people yeah. come up to meet you are they you know that really don't know you are they shocked at how pleasant of a guy you actually are yeah. i think they are i think they are a little bit i think too uh, and this not what's not so much as the people that aren't death metal fans as much as it is the people that are death metal fans because they have a, a, an expectation yeah. of what you should be and I'm the I'm the polar opposite of every death metal guy out there. For one, I joke on stage all the time, and that really throws the crowd. They're like, "What? <laughs> Why is he making jokes?" <laughs> I'm like, I'm here to listen to like brutal music and like you know say Satan all the time. Why is this guy like making jokes and cracking up? And like, I've always been that way. Um, I, I just I probably wanted to be a stand-up comedian. I ended up. Be, doing death metal for some reason <laughs> I don't, but uh I don't, I don't know it's just like um and it, it just and it's weird it's weird i'm i'm not a typical death metal guy i'm not one of those guys i'm for one thing like I, i'm not into the whole satan thing i never have been mm. that's never been my thing i kind of think it's kind of goofy <laughs> actually to be honest with you and that's probably my dad's fault <laughs> because <laughs> My dad is a big horror movie fan, too, yeah. and when I was little, the first exposure I ever had to Satan. Now, I grew up on my mom's side Catholic. My dad was kind of like what I call a secret atheist. Like, I didn't <laughs> learn he was an atheist until many years later. And I'm like, oh, dad, you're an atheist? I am, too. Wow, how <laughs> cool is this? Um, but, yeah, then he got then he went into the whole thing telling me about how, you know, he didn't like, you know, the reason he didn't like the church. And I, I was – but I knew my entire life growing up my dad – was always encouraging my love of horror yeah. and love of horror movies and, and big Halloween time was always big for me because my dad really went all out and you know my dad was the first guy to show me how to make fake blood he, 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 he would make props and you know he was always into this the special effects of stuff so that's why I grew up loving horror movies and love the special effects side of things but like I was saying my exposure to Satanism was my dad's fault and I can tell you the story <laughs> it's great the first time I really got to see it, because, you know, you you exposed to it through movies. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And the first one, most people say it's The Exorcist. I'm like, no. You know what the first movie I got to expose was? There's a movie called The Devil's Reign. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's got William Shatner, and it's got Ernest Borgnine. Oh, cool. And <laughs> it sounds cool, but it's actually very goofy. So this <laughs> is the first time I get, I, get, I get exposed to Satanism through Captain Kirk, <laughs> and and Mikhail's Navy. Yes. Okay, yeah. Ernest Borgnine. Yeah. I watched when I was a little kid with my dad. It was Mikhail's Navy. So I'm I'm watching Mikhail now. Mikhail Ernest Borgnine is supposed to be this evil priest called Corbin, and he turns into this goat looking dude. <laughs> but I'm looking at this thing, watching, and my dad's cracking up. We're watching it together. And he's dying laughing. He's like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> when Ernest Borgnine turns into this goat-like thing, all I can see is Mikhail's Navy looking <laughs> yeah. like a goat. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, this is not scary. I, Captain Kirk, first off, is fighting this evil dude. It's not even evil. It's goofy. So that's my first exposure to Satanism. And I could never get that out of my mind because the entire time my dad was laughing. <laughs> this whole movie, he's dying laughing. And... I, you know, I guess I grew up as a Star Trek fan, as a you know, little kid watching all the syndicated Star Trek, so Captain Kirk, and so I'm, William Shatner to me was Captain Kirk, yeah. and I don't I, until until he did, I think, uh, um, what's the one he played the cop? T.J. Hooker. Oh yeah. T.J. Yeah, Hooker. Until he did T.J. Hooker, he was Captain Kirk. Oh yeah. All the way up. No matter what I saw him in, as hey, it's Captain Kirk. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm watching Captain Kirk battle McHale's Navy. <laughs> turn into the satanic priest in the dumbest movie I've ever seen. It's so stupid, but people love that movie. It's a cult classic now. And that's my real exposure to Satanism. So every time I think of evil or Satan, 
I can cannot get my dad's laughing out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of classics, let's talk a little bit from about from beyond. I mean, the, yeah. that that album. Let's face it, it it's held uh, very acclaimed by a lot of people, oh, yeah. and, and it's got this cult following to it. Um, back in the day when you guys were recording that album, did you ever have any idea that it would have the effect on the death metal community that it still holds today? Absolutely not. <laughs> and the reason why is I could tell you when in 91 we recorded that, but a lot of that material was written in 86 and 87. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> I literally, when we were massacred back then, there was probably us and w worldwide probably 10 to 12 other death metal bands. Mm -hmm. Now you have 10 to 12 death metal bands around every block around the world. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, actually, we didn't think it was going to be as big as it, it ended up becoming. It's like... Um, I never thought it was going to be. I, I thought, okay, I maybe would be lucky and put out one album, and that was it, and everybody would say, oh, yeah, and then forget about it, like three years later. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I literally thought it was just going to be like that. It's a, it, 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 it amazes me how certain albums, regardless of the genre, still hold the importance yeah. of the now than it did when it was released 30-plus years ago or whatever else. But anyway... Um, I wanted to kind of discuss with you, and I'll pass the next question over to Jeff because I'm hogging all the questions right now. But um, you know, you remember that that uh, that documentary that was on VH1, the uh, the Headbangers Journey. Do you remember that with the yes, ba banger? I mm -hmm. So I remember they were going through all of the genres and the subgenres of metal, and it, you know, it, it just went through all the, this like this tree and all the mm -hmm. branches of metal. And for you. Being in, into the metal movement of one of those subgenres, do you think that something like that, when you have to dissect every single genre of metal, is 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 it good for 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 heavy metal, or do you think it's like okay, this is just oversaturated, this is just stupid? Where, where yeah, your, yeah. where's your thoughts at? I'm on the stupid side. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I just I, I was like for for one, I was like. The category, categorizing, the categorizing. I just yeah. don't understand it. It's, it's. I get it. I mean, I'm a movie collector, so I kind of get it. When you kind of like, you're starting to put your, your like. I'm using my examples. I'm putting putting my my Blu-rays or my DVDs on the shelf. I'm like, okay, does this go into classic horror, <laughs> or does this go into modern horror, yeah. or you know, it's kind of like the same horror thing. Comedy. But then, I, 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 but yes, I agree. It's gotten to a point where it's just like, like you said, it's oversaturated. It's like, okay, I actually saw something and it was a joke in a movie. Actually, I think the movie was, uh, I recently saw it too. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, would they call themselves a post death metal band? A hmm. post death metal band? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It was. A, I think the band. I think the movie's Metalheads, and I think it's the one that's on Netflix. And the band, the guys were saying, "Yeah, we're a post. We're not death metal band. We're a post death metal band." <laughs> and I was like, "Is that a real genre?" And now there's a band that literally we're playing with Friday. This Friday, they called themselves a post death metal band. I'm like, "Oh, these guys just watched that movie." <laughs> yeah. You, you know, years ago we had. Uh, Tony Demolition Man Dolan from you know, Venom and now which yeah. Venom Inc. now and and he he had a very interesting comment about the the categorizing of, of metal and for him what he thought Venom what Venom Inc. is however you what however you want to say it he said we're just a rock and roll band we just play really heavy he goes get that heavy metal shit out of there he goes we're just a we're just a rock and roll band that's really heavy do you ever just kind right. of feel like hey we're just a really heavy rock and roll band I'm a punker I'm a punker. So I, I'm playing punk. I, I, I'm a huge Misfits fan. Mm -hmm. That's literally what got me into music in the first place. Um, Misfits, uh, early um, Dead Kennedys, that kind of stuff. So I, when I when I think of it like, oh, okay, all they did was take the punk rock D beat and just, uh, you know, distorted the guitars and just made it heavier. That's literally what you got death metal out of um you know thrash of course it was coming out of the bay area thrash like bands like slayer and stuff like that but it literally just was taking the aggression of the punk side of stuff mm. and saying okay we're not going to sing about politics anymore we're going to sing about the devil <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> 
Very good. Very good. Jeff, you got the next question? Well, well you've alluded to being a, a film collector and, and uh, loving the horror films. Um, I think I read, uh, did you get to star in a film? Or not really star, but uh, were, you a, were you a serial killer in a film called uh, Deep Sea? I was, and the movie's awful. <laughs> I don't even think it came. I don't even think it came out. Like I was, I was just. I tell people this to everybody. everybody I say, look, I was the actor in it. it. You call me acting. I mean, I was literally just basically like, you know, a serial killer. Yeah. I mean, but I, I, the movie was pretty awful. I, I'll admit it. I'll admit it was awful. It was terrible. I came in like mid midway through it where they lost the original guy that was going to play the part. And um, they just kind of like casted me in this part and threw me in the movie. I like, I think I remember one time trying to suggest something to the director and he was just like not having it. And he was one of those directors that was just, he was there, but he wasn't. Yeah. And he was like, he was there. I'm like, hey, he's the director. Isn't he supposed to direct? <laughs> like, <laughs> he's just sitting there. What's going on? Yeah. And, like, and, and his wife was doing most of the directing. And I was like, I don't know. I'm just going to finish this up because I'm getting paid. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very how, good. how did that experience come to you, come your way? Yeah. It was it was cool to be in a movie and to be on movie sets and kind of like, even though it was a small, low budget movie and stuff. It was cool to to be in that. And majority of the time, like I'm a big effects guy, so I was hanging out with the effects people all yeah. the time. Oh yeah. And I was just like, like, oh, let's see how this works. And even the effects people, you know. They're great people, and I'm still friends with some of them today. They were young and inexperienced themselves, and they actually had a they had a prop go wrong, mm. and the guy was kind of like really being penny pinching, and uh, the prop went wrong, and uh, and I was trying to like talk to the director. The guy was a hothead, and I was like, dude, it's you know it's a practical effects. They they don't always work the right the first time, and. Uh, He's like, well, fuck it. We're just going to screw it, and I'm going to just reshoot this whole thing. Uh, we're going to do it this way. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you just ruined one of the best money shots in the movie. <laughs> one of the best murder scenes. You're just going to, like, just throw it out the window. And he made it a made it one of those cheap cutaway scenes, oh, like uh, when you see in movies. Yeah. And it's like, oh. Well, what it was was it was, it was a scene where I was supposed to hit a, a girl in the head with a sledgehammer, and the head was supposed to explode. Well, the prop – didn't go right so instead he just had it where the hammer comes down and the screen goes black oh. i was like oh that's terrible but you know <laughs> like i said the movie's awful i don't think it, it, it went into distribution and it got held up in distribution and it never came out okay. now i have a copy of it and people keep asking me for a bootleg i'm like well I'll wait till i'm dead then yeah, it'll be yeah, something yeah. special yeah <laughs> All right, I got one last question for you. We'll leave you alone for the night. So right. ask this question a lot. If you listen to a couple episodes before this, you'd kind of understand. The mystery of rock and roll. Uh, you are in a band that back in the day had some mystery to it. Uh, there's no mystique anymore with the dawning of the Internet, social media, and so forth. Do you think that uh, with the Internet and social media taking the mystery out of rock and roll, has it been a good thing, or do you like the accessibility of what the Internet gives us to artists? If we didn't have the Internet, we wouldn't be doing this right now with you. That's true. Um, it's, it's a double-edged sword. It really is. It's a double-edged sword. Uh, one, one side cuts good, and the other side cuts deep mm -hmm. the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it goes back to the whole, like, uh, I'll give you a really quick example. And then I was a tape trader back in the day. Oh, yeah. So... Uh, when I remember when the internet first was coming out and everyone was pirating albums and people were like, Oh, you know, this is bad. This is, you're taking money away from the artist." I remember a guy saying it was just like tape trading. Yeah. Right. And I was like, Oh, I guess <laughs> it is. Although when we tape traded, I think we did it. So we would learn something cause we yep. didn't have the accessibility of the internet and we would learn something. And then we would make us go out and buy, seek out the album and buy yeah. it oh, yeah. and actually own it. So I don't know. Like I said, it's a double-edged sword. Like I can see how it helps get the word out. Like I remember, I remember the MySpace days. I literally remember. I preferred MySpace. I remember the MySpace <laughs> days. That was like a real big. And it's, now I think it still exists as a mu as a music platform. Right. It's like there for music musicians, and that was great for us in the beginning for musicians. And then Facebook came along, and then it just everything blew up. But I remember the battles with the whole 
uh, downloading the piracy of stuff and, and, and everything was started in the MySpace days where people were like, oh, I don't need to buy the album anymore. I can just, you know, I can just pirate it off here. I can just download the whole thing here. And then it, it was cool until someone did it to one of my albums. <laughs> and I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> you know? Um, but, yeah, it's it's weird. It's And it's, it's a, I think that's a question that we're going to be asking for a long time. Mm-hmm. And, and to ourselves and to everybody else like and like you said it it, it helps in one aspect but in another it kind of hinders us it hurt, hurts us and like you said it, it is the mystery i think that's why there's so many gimmicky bands now bands that come out and you don't know who the guys are in the band <laughs> like because uh, that's like the only mystery left and exactly. who is that Exactly. Yeah, who's that behind that mask? Who is that mask man? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're out of our allotted time for the evening. Uh, is there okay. any? Is there anything that we did not cover tonight that you would like to plug or promote? Well, yeah, I mean, Massacre's out there. We're going to be touring. We actually have a tour coming up in September. Uh, actually, September first, when I release the casket mutilations, we're actually going over to Europe. We'll be touring over Europe. It's just a short tour, nine days. But this Friday, we're playing locally. I hate playing locally, but we're playing locally, calling it like a pre-European tour show. So that's kind of getting us in gear. And like I said, the Casket Mutilations is coming out. We have that uh, coming out in September. And then we're going to try to probably take a break until the end of the year. It's like uh, we've been kind of like pushing this since – resurgence came out and kind of doing all the singles and stuff so we're gonna take a little bit of a break and then we're gonna hit next year with a lot of touring i think we're just gonna go out there and just hopefully if the world opens up a little bit better and we can not have lost luggage and i keep hearing horror stories about bands losing their guitars and stuff hopefully that doesn't happen to us when we go out there to tour in europe and everywhere i'm really looking to kind of 2023 got to be the the year that i really push us out there performing Oh, very good. Nice. Well, we're about two to three weeks behind on our episodes, so we'll, Jeff, the editing wizard over here, will get everything cleaned up. But um, we're, we're looking at what, maybe, Jeff, you think maybe end of the month, maybe? Yeah. First part of, yeah, whatever. First part of September, maybe at, at the latest. And once it's all cleaned up, we'll send it to you, to your PR people, everything. And get it oh, go- cool. All right, my man, thank right, you so thank, much. Take care. for joining all us. Right. All right, thank you. Be well. Right. Bye-bye.
to the night you think you know night demon then the night demon heavy metal podcast is for you step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon we're talking band history song analysis studio anecdotes stories from the road it's everything a diehard night demon fan could want and more this is the only place to learn the inside scoop the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts.